Good afternoon. I think we'll begin. Thank you for coming. This is uh, in part uh, a Hesburgh Auditorium version of Intro to Peace Studies, my usual 2 to 3.15 class on Tuesday, Thursdays. Welcome. But especially welcome to others of you who've joined us uh, in response to the emails and things and uh, who, are, who know Sean or are interested in the uh, particular topic. We're, we're delighted to have you. My name is George Lopez. I am the Hesburgh Professor of Peace Studies Emeritus, which means I'm trying to learn how to be retired, but I'm still doing the same things I seem to do for 30 years. Um, and uh, I, I have had the incredible privilege of working over about 25 years on sanctions issues, which led me to be concerned about North Korea, which led the U.S. government in their folly to ask me to take the U.S. seat on the Security Council panel of experts for monitoring the sanctions on South Korea between uh, 2010 and 2011. Um, and uh, that also then has led me to be a frequent commentator on North Korea issues. So that's what brings me here today. But it also brings me here because finally, Sean King and I get to meet in person and to talk on the same stage. We've talked on different segments of Bloomberg and different segments of various things because Sean is a uh, what I would call real East Asia analyst. He is currently the senior vice president at Park Strategies, which is a uh, business management and consulting and advisory firm. Uh, some of you good New Yorkers will know the name Alphonse D'Amato, a good senator from New York for a number of years. He worked for him as a senator and now works for him. Uh, Alphonse is the managing director of that strategy center. Uh, as expected, Sean's uh, expertise is in East Asia, does a lot of travel there and uh, recruiting and servicing clients. He comes to us, uh, comes to D'Amato's after a five year stint at the U.S. Department of Commerce, working as a senior advisor in various ventures in uh, East Asia. And uh, before that, also did some work for the State Department of Development in New York State. States, of course, being foreign policy actors in their own to develop. He's a graduate, uh, undergraduate of American University. He is a MBA here from the University of Notre Dame, hence the hat, and his travel to uh, hockey games here and there and everywhere uh, for the uh, seeing the, the good fighting Irish great team of this year. And um, we've just been ships passing in the night. He consults with the East Asia program here at the Lew Institute, with the business school, does various things, so this is a good opportunity. And for those of you who believe in cultural immersion, it's very important to know, like a good East Asia specialist, he is fluent in Swedish. <laughs> it's a story all its own. Here's our format today, and welcome, Sean. Uh, we, we are going to go 15 minutes each, maybe pose a question to each other that you know will nail the other guy in something he can't answer, but then throw it open for your uh, questions and comments and curiosities. Sean, welcome. Thanks very much. Always great to be back on campus. Good to see so many familiar faces like Patrick from the Lou Institute and Lionel Jensen, whose classes I've been into, and other hockey connections elsewhere. <laughs> uh, first of all, as you said, I do work for Senator D'Amato in New York, but everything I say is my thoughts alone and nothing to do with the firm or the center. So blame me, not him. I do speak Swedish. I speak no Asian language. Uh, I've been to South Korea more times than I can remember. I've stood at the DMZ in 1997 and peered into North Korea, but I've never set foot in North Korea itself on principle. Uh, but I did go to East Germany four times during the Cold War, if that counts for anything. Uh, there are a lot of parallels between East Germany and Korea, but a lot of differences too. But it gives you some, at least gives me some framework when I'm trying to understand the current situation. Uh, North Korea is a lot like an episode of Dynasty or the Americans in that you can just pick up anywhere in the series and kind of get something out of it, enjoy it for what you will. But if you happen to have been with the show from the beginning, it helps you put things into certain context. So while discussing what's been going on the last few weeks, I also want to here and there put in some historical context points so maybe we can all understand it better going forward. Uh, I am okay with Trump meeting Kim Jong-un at whatever date and location they choose. The point is, the reason I'm okay with that is because the invitation came through South Korea. And North Korea, unlike, say, East Germany, is actually an ultra-nationalist, xenophobic, if you could say, alt-right Korean state. They say, we are the true Korea. We are only Koreans, we are independent, we don't intermarry with other races, we are descendant through Kim Jong-il 
who they say was born in this holy mountain, a Mount Baekdu between Korea and China, to Dong An, the mythical Korean god king from 2333 BC. Unlike South Korea, that marries other races, people dye their hair, and they allow foreign troops on their soil, and they're just a tool and puppet of Japan and American colonialism. So they have refused to engage and acknowledge South Korea because they consider them an illegitimate occupied colonial puppet state. And for years, North Korea has been calling for direct talks only with the United States while ignoring the South. And we could never directly engage North Korea without them first engaging our ally because then we're undercutting our own ally. Just like we could only establish diplomatic relations with East Germany in 1974 after the two Germanys recognized each other in 1972. As recently as July of last year, en route to the G20 summit in Hamburg, uh, South Korean President Moon Jae-in gave a speech in Berlin, incorrectly trying to apply the uh, lessons of German unification to Korea's situation today. In it, he extended an olive branch to the North, asking for negotiations. And Rodong Simbo in the state newspaper in North Korea blasted him, saying the nerve of this illegitimate colonial puppet to make such an insincere offer on foreign soil in front of people with a different skin color and language than we. People forget the racial undercurrents of North Korean state, state ideology. But Trump, to his credit, froze out North Korea, extended sanctions, ratcheted up his so-called maximum pressure campaign, which I call only really moderate pressure, because as George knows, uh, a lot of the real action that North Korea conducts around the world to generate hard currency to keep the regime in power and fund the weapons program is not actually done under North Korean domicile or named entities. It's actually done through shell companies in other countries, mostly mainland China, but not only. So until we get serious on secondary sanctions against the other entities and countries fronting for North Korea, we won't bring North Korea ink to its knees. But Trump has done more than previous presidents in extending pressure on them. Uh, eventually, North Korea blinked, if you want to think this, and decided to engage the South directly. There are four possible reasons that they decided to accept the South's overtures. One, it could be that the sanctions were getting to them. Two, this is the 70th anniversary of North Korea as a state, and this may be some kind of uh, big anniversary moment. Three, it could be now that they have an ICBM that could hit the United States, we don't yet know if a nuke could survive re-entry and actually cause a nuclear explosion, but it's enough for us to think about. It could be now that Kim Jong-un feels he's in a position of strength to reach out to the South and uh, meet directly with Trump. Also, the fact that Trump during the campaign and certain things he has said since being in office suggests that he does not believe in the U.S.-South Korea alliance as much as previous U.S. presidents have done. Remember during the campaign, he threatened to pull U.S. troops out of South Korea if they didn't pay up more for uh, their share of the burden. And even you know during trade talks, he's threatened to pull troops out and slap South Korea with steel tariffs. So they feel that Trump may give them an opening to detach the U.S. and South Korea alliance. And right now, there is a liberal president in South Korea. But again, uh, just like communism in North Korea doesn't fit what we think of it as in Europe, liberal in South Korea doesn't always fit what we think of it as here. Liberal in South Korea means more nationalistic. Uh, the left in Korea is an outlier, and then it's more nationalist and interested in ethnicity than the right. Often the right are considered tools of Japan, American, and foreign uh, colonialisms and corporates. It's the left in Korea that tends to be more focused on internal Korean matters, and that's why this ultra-nationalist ideology from Pyongyang plays well on South Korea's political left. So they want to take advantage of a liberal nationalist president in the South. You have a president in the U.S. who might want to detach the alliance. Now, with the ICBMs, now could be the time for outreach. So considering that the South is involved, we would have looked like warmongers and we would have been undercutting our ally if we did not accept Kim's invitation. And it was a stroke of genius that whoever in the White House had the knowledge to let the South Korean envoys read the invitation from Kim to Trump for themselves outside the White House, the Oval Office, because that shows that South Korea is in the driver's seat and it sort of lays light to this North Korean myth that they are but a puppet of ours. This shows that South Korea is making its own decisions and we're here to support them. That said, the whole process is backwards. Usually you spend a year or two of building up at the lower level for a possible meeting, especially when it comes to two leaders, two countries that have never met before, with 
the prestige of the US president. So this is in classic Trump fashion, completely backwards, completely spontaneous. Trump should have consulted his own staff. He should have given at least Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was at Mar-a-Lago today trying to do damage control, because he's feel like he's being left out of the process, a heads up, because Japan, from which we ran the Korean War in 1950 when North Korea invaded, uh, has been our most loyal, steadfast ally on this issue. And they have the most to lose. North Korea, again, considers the entire Korean Peninsula its territory. So they would never nuke the South. They would use ballistic missiles, artillery, and gunfire, but they wouldn't nuke the South. They have said, though, that if necessary in their mind, they would nuke Japan, especially US assets there. So Japan has the most to lose, and they're being kept out of this. And we have the most troops in Asia, in Japan. So Trump has to do definitely some damage control with Abe. That said, denuclearization, as Kim Jong-un has said, first by the South, then by China, and now Trump says they're saying it to us, does not mean what we think. North Korea cannot, it will not denuclearize. <coughs> and we now know from declassified Soviet archives that North Korea started first trying to get nukes in the 1960s after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because Khrushchev, who uh, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, Kim Il-sung, hated because he dissed his boy Stalin, whom he emulated, uh, he would have seen Khrushchev as selling out Castro in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this just proved Kim's ultranational xenophobic point that you cannot rely on foreigners to protect your own security. And they know that they invaded South Korea in 1950 in the Korean War, and they were pushed back because of the US interference. They need something to make us, to give us second thoughts or pause about coming to South Korea's defense again. North Korea cannot exist long term so long as South Korea is there. Because if you're built on a nationalist, xenophobic ideal of being one true Korea, how can you exist if there's a much larger, more successful, wealthier Korea right next door? You need something to justify your existence. So that's why they have to keep on a constant war footing. North Korea has fewer than 30 million people, yet they have the fourth largest standing army of the world, in the world, the vast majority of which is forward deployed to demilitarize zone between South and North. So the nukes are there, not as a defensive matter, as too many apologists say, but it's offensive. It's so that if they were to ever intimidate or invade the South again, we would have to say, do we really want to sacrifice San Francisco for Seoul? And without those nukes, they, don't lo they lose that insurance policy, and then they are just another poorer version of South Korea, and they'll no longer have reason to exist. Uh, recently declassified German East German cables from 1977 were on the Deutsche Welle website translated to English in January, where East German diplomats in North Korea were writing home to East Berlin warning their government that North Korea was actively trying to get nukes. So the idea that this is because of something we did, the Saddam or Qaddafi, that's bunk. This has been going on for 50 years. So they can't give up the nukes. I don't know what they're going to talk about. The fear is, especially among East Asian allies and friends, is that Trump will get some kind of concession on the ICBMs that hit the United States, but do nothing about the short and medium, but accept as a fait accompli the short and medium range missiles that intimidate South Korea and Japan. And again, South Korea doesn't have to worry about the nuclear issue, but Japan certainly does. Now, one reassurance in all this is the naming of John Bolton as National Security Advisor in the Trump administration, because he was involved in the six party talks 15 years ago where North Korea tried the same trick. So he knows what denuclearization really means when they say it. He's also fanatically pro-Japan. He's been one of the most eloquent voices for a permanent Japanese seat on the UN Security Council. But troubling to some was Mike Pompeo, the CIA chief, who's a real hawk on North Korea. During his confirmation hearings last week in Washington, he kept emphasizing how Trump is going to meet Kim to address the direct ballistic missile threat to the United States. And when he was pressed whether or not that includes the missiles to South Korea and Japan, he refused to answer. So it almost, they're worried that Trump's America first rhetoric is actually going to be America only. And a lot of our allies are getting very nervous in the region. Uh, also, Trump, before accepting Kim's invitation, he should have insisted that the three Americans being held in North Korea be released. So Otto Wambier's death, the University of Virginia student from Colorado last year, that seemed to have a profound effect on Trump. And he spoke very passionately about it, both at the UN General Assembly and the South Korean Assembly this year. It really seemed to touch his humanity, sort of like the chemical weapons attack on the Syrian children. Uh, so he should have insisted for that up front, because assuming 
North Korea gives us those three Americans as part of the summit, that's then a deliverable that the North has given us. Then they're gonna want something in return. That should have been up front to begin with. Location, where is it gonna happen? You know, he's in real estate, location, location, location. We still haven't talked about where. I'm more concerned about where as opposed to when. Uh, you know, let's just cancel them out. Pyongyang would be a disaster because then it would be portrayed to the North Korean people as Trump paying tribute to Kim Jong Un. And remember, North Koreans are told that we started the North Korea, that we started the Korean War in 1950, that we invaded Korea, conveniently ignoring the fact there were no U.S. troops in Korea at the time, which is why the Korean War happened. Had there been, the North never would have invaded. They're then told totally leaving out the Chinese assistance that Mao Zedong rescued them, that Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, single-handedly beat us back and we had to sue for peace in the armistice at the DMZ, which is where the South and North Korean presidents are going to meet next Friday. So if we went to the DMZ, that would be bad because that would be a replay of the armistice. If we go to Beijing, you're giving China too much control. Kim does not deserve a White House visit. So I think a neutral country would be great. Uh, so it's not homage to eat, an homage to either. Sweden would be ideal for me, not just because of my language skills, but because in lieu of formal diplomatic relations with North Korea, Sweden represents U.S. In interests. So whenever a U.S. tourist is taken hostage or put in prison in North Korea, it's a Swedish ambassador he or she meets. So I would like to see it there. It would probably be considered too pro-American for it to be held in Sweden, so they may go for somewhere like Switzerland. I've even heard Mongolia is an option, which is fine with me as long as it's not China or somewhere on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the foreign minister of North Korea, Mr. Ri, who gave his bombastic speech at the UN in September where he threatened an atmospheric bomb test over the Pacific, he was in Stockholm two weeks ago, and Sweden has said they're actively negotiating the release of those three Americans. So maybe Stockholm is it, I'm not sure, but I'd be happy with anywhere in Europe or Mongolia. Trump needs to hit them on human rights. I know that's a loaded term, and it's often like the West putting its view of the world, but North Korea was high, heavily indicted uh, the Commission of Inquiry in the UN Human Rights Commission, run by uh, not a lot of US traditional allies, but the depravity of human rights abuses, these gulags where people are not born, they're grown, sort of like the Matrix, is obscene and has to be, has to be stopped. And there was a uh, referral to the International Criminal Court in The Hague against Kim Jong-un himself. And North Korean diplomats went crazy. There was a charm offensive. They were flying to New York trying to lobby people to release this. Maybe that will stop him from going to Sweden because he's afraid he'll be deported to The Hague. I don't know. Like Julian Assange hanging out in the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. But uh, they get crazy on that. And you know, like in hockey, if you're down a goal with a minute to go, you start making passes up the middle that you know you shouldn't, but you do it anyway because you're in a frenzy. Let's get the North Koreans thinking in a frenzy. Let's make them make mistakes and see what happens. So if we keep pushing on this commission of inquiry and human rights, it's gonna drive them crazy and that can only be to our advantage. Also information, one thing I saw in East Germany was West German t TV was legal in East Germany after 1971. And East Germans would watch West German TV, not to find out what's going on in West Germany, but to find out what was going on in their own, in East Germany. Because then there were West German foreign correspondents in East Berlin, Dresden, and Leipzig. So if they want to know what was going on in their own country, they would watch West German TV. We need to flood North Korea with information. Because North Koreans, remember this is a hermetic, xenophobic state. They're not even allowed to watch Chinese and Russian TV. It's not that it's anti-Western, it's anti-foreign. They're not allowed any contact with any foreigners whatsoever. So if you're caught with a Chinese newspaper or a Russian broadcast, you're in big trouble. Not as much as South Korea or American, but still, anything foreign is strictly taboo. So the more we can flood North Korea with information about the outside world, the better. And they can't jam the broadcast the way they used to due to the electricity and fuel shortage. So let's take advantage of those situations. The last thing I'll say on that is one defector, she said, what cinched it for her to cross the, to escape by China was getting a South Korean newspaper in a balloon that was sent over the border where they criticized the South Korean president. And she said, wow. That, the fact that South Koreans were criticizing their own president. Now there are other defectors come out of North Korea who were told as children that Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father, knows what you're thinking. So you can't even think a bad thought about it because there is this God cult-like status. She said, if they're criticizing their president, that means all the other anti-Kim propaganda I got must be real. I want to live in a country where I can criticize my president. She said that's what convinced her to cross the border. So the more information we can send in there, the better. And we need to keep in mind 
Trump also has to be ready to walk away. No deal is better than a good deal. We can't minimize our assets in the region. We can't minimize the pressure. We need to up the pressure. We can't desert our allies. But we can't think of this in terms of a midterm election cycle. We, it's been 70 years. We have, to, we have to do this right. And we can't only think of it in terms of Korea. Korea is thinking of it only in terms of Korea. But North Korea's main benefactor, China, they're seeing this in the bigger picture. And it's no accident that Kim Jong-un went to Beijing only a few days after Trump signed the Taiwan Travel Act, which upset Xi Jinping greatly. Then you have what's going on in the South China Sea. To learn more about that, I suggest you take one of Lionel's classes, and I'm not going to get into that now. But just remember, there are forces on the other side playing a much bigger, more complicated game beyond just what's going on in the North Korean uh, Peninsula. So keep the big picture in mind. Stay true to your friends. And with that, I look forward to what George has to say. Thank you. John, thank you. Uh, gives me the ability to arrange a little bit differently with all the good stuff that John has covered. I'd like to go directly to the negotiation, that is, what might happen and what's at risk with Trump and Kim meeting. Um, and, and for those in the tradition of conflict resolution, you'll remember that good old Roger Fisher from Harvard used to say, the best way to analyze any negotiation is to look at the people, look at the process, and look at the problem, and how the process and the people look at the problem. So that's what I want to do. Uh, let's start with the people. Could there be any more two interesting people in the globe to meet one-on-one -on -one for the first time with incredible amount of stakes of global security than Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump? We have in Kim, most analysts would say, the art of the bait and switch. Not, not so much maybe in his heritage, because he's still starting out of the gate, but in terms of his father and the grandfather. If you followed US-Korean relations and the attempt to make deals before, the critique has always been, yeah, whatever the US might have screwed up pales in significance to the notion that these guys get what they want at a certain kind of time, and then move off that and switch back to being tougher and nastier and even more threatening. And all they've done is buy time across the decades so that they're at the strategic capability which they find themselves now. So if we, at least for the moment, label Kim Jong-un the art of the bait and switch, it's not a surprise to you that he's meeting now the art of the deal. What happens when those two come together in a summit? Well, the truth is we could have as many prognostications as the people in this room and beyond that. Area experts, strategic analysts, weapons experts, pundits, any number of cultural analysts have given us all the alternatives that might happen. I think, in terms of the people, each has invested enough by having this happen that each needs the other to agree to something that's going to look like a concession for them, but also looks like a victory for the enterprise, or a concession for your foe and a victory for you. That can include a range of things. It could be 24 hours before, or probably more likely 48 hours after the summit, Kim releases the hostages that Sean has talked about. And Trump can claim a victory there, even if he has no victory on any of the other issues. It might be that the power of the photo ops is good enough for the both of them, saying they've scheduled three other meetings in the next 18 months, and they've ordered the underlings to get to brass tacks about denuclearization, but I'll come to that in a minute. I think that the prospects for stomping on the table by either one and walking out in rage probably is thought about as good diplomatic theater, but probably won't be actualized. I have some sympathy for Sean's view that it's better to have no deal and walk away than to have a bad deal. But at the same time, I don't think this is about deal making. I think this is going to be about posturing. It's going to be about positioning. It's going to be about giving some marching orders to the folks below. And it will be about lip service to the prospect for greater security cooperation, ill-defined. I fear that many of the Trump people don't understand, and it's actually not been very much discussed in the press, which might contribute to this, that from a North Korean point of view, the notion that an American president is meeting one-on-one -on -one with you anywhere in the world 
is something that hasn't happened before. So in terms of Kim Jong-un's initial victory, even though the invitation has all the right cultural and face-saving logistics that Sean mentioned about it being conveyed by the South, engineered by the South, and then given to Trump, the notion that an American president, the first sitting American president, is going to go over and have a one-on-one -on -one with the North Korean president, uh, North Korean leader, is a significant concession to start with. So if Kim thinks, I'm on a roll, therefore I can propose this, 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 and this, and let's see if he'll bite, that'll be interesting to see. So that's enough for the moment about the people, although we may want to talk about the people that accompany these two leaders and the scope and size and direction of that. The process. Well, part of the process is going to be where is it located, and what does that say in terms of neutrality, equality among the parties, and various other kinds of things. Uh, are both of the sides, or each of the sides, going to come in with a full-blown pattern of expectations, maybe not stated as demands, but this is the outcomes they prefer? Or are they going to tiptoe across a series of issues and just try to build a personal relationship? Do they see this as a one-off, which has to uh, really produce results? There's a lot of ways, at least in the Tillerson area, that Tillerson tried to downplay the notion that you accomplish very much in a single meeting. Most analysts would say that, especially in the lack of preparation and specialists being involved, on, at least on the US side, going in. But it is likely that something will happen. But hopefully, from my point of view, it means a minor triumph of diplomacy a utility to talking, and a scheduling of other meetings that will get down to more brass tacks. On the U.S. side, on the process, I think in order to do that, you have to urge or get a guarantee from Kim that the hiatus we've seen in testing of both the nukes themselves and of missiles will continue. That we would consider, after the first meeting, further testing as beyond the spirit of the diplomatic approach we're trying to take. It would be a betrayal of the process. Now what Kim might see as a betrayal of the process and make in his own set of demands, uh, I'll tell you honestly, I can't exactly fathom. I think if Trump opens up the human rights issues, which he very well may do, I think that throws a big boulder in the way of the road of discussion that at least if I were a key advisor to this administration, I would say you don't do it the first meeting. Everybody knows what we know about how terrible you are. We don't have to play that card because we always have that card. We do have to, however, express dismay that given the significance of the meeting, three American hostages are still being held. That is, I fully agree with Sean on, on the issues of the, of the hostage issue. Now that brings us to the problem. Sean's already alluded to it. Let me go a little bit more extensively. On the one hand, the problem is denuclearization. But the deep difference in understandings and meaning of that are what separates them by miles and miles and miles longer than Mongolia, if that's where they meet. That is, by denuclearization, Trump at his most vocal is, I'm going to go to the meeting and I'm going to tell him he's got to denuclearize or else. I'm going to tell him we're strangling him economically, it can get worse. We don't have patience. We don't want any more testing. Let's get inspectors in there. Let's denuclearize. Even if that were what we might call puffery, it's not what Kim thinks about denuclearization. What Kim thinks about denuclearization is, uh, at least in the wildest dreams, in exchange for that on the North Korean side, we have the absence of a THAAD system in South Korea. We have the movement of all US submarines and other vessels that carry nuclear weapons capability out of waters that are in reach of Korea, way, way back to the continental Pacific uh, rim for the United States. We might even have uh, moving those bombers that carry nuclear weapons that are based in Guam out of harm's way from a North Korean point of view. And then that's before we get to the issue of the annual exercises and uh, the uh, leaving of large numbers of troops that are in the South. So denuclearization for Kim is exceedingly different than denuclearization for Trump. And the willingness to trade, or even think about that as a trade, is beyond the pale for any American negotiator who's accompanying Trump. 
I know one colleague from disarmament days in D.C. who said, you know, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe they'll be a walk in the woods. You know, just like uh, Reagan and Gorby, they take off, the aides aren't surrounding them with all the stats and whatever, whatever, and they say, what do you want? What do you want? You know, and they come back and they say, you know, we think this thing should be just totally denuclearized. I'd like to see John Bolton when Trump says to him, you know what, we're going to remove everything. They say they're going to do things like that. I think it would be better for everybody. That's not going to hold. Probably won't happen. They probably won't even walk in the woods. But anything is possible here. The crux of the issue is the different definition of the problem. How do you solve that? Well, maybe you don't deal with the first meeting. Maybe you decide, well, we've got a couple other little problems. How about, how about let's build a real peace treaty instead of an armistice as a sign of goodwill, what might be considered not only a face-saving measure, but a confidence-building measure to the other side. Maybe we'll open each side up for new cultural, economic, and social exchanges. Any number of things that are window dressing that really don't matter to the key problem at hand. But the only advantage of that may be you're taking a step in the direction of more diplomacy down the road, and this is what we want to do. The unique part of this that I like is that this is a top-down strategy by the leaders first, giving orders to the underlings for how to put together the plan, which is different, as Sean mentioned, from the strategies which have marked Korean-U.S. Uh, relations when they've gotten together, which is the experts putting them together, then bringing the final product to each of the leaders, or one or both of them rejecting it because they feel it's too costly for their side. It may be if the direct parameters are set by the people at the top, the top-down diplomacy does filter down and lead to some agreements. I don't think either side likes the idea of interim agreements. I don't think Mr. Trump has a level of view and patience of what might it take to reach serious denuclearization to the extent to which we can get there as it being a three, five, maybe even seven year process. Mr. Kim has time on his side. He doesn't run for re-election despite his different bad habits and potential diabetes that puts him in bad health, he's likely to think he's got another 30 years under his belt. Mr. Trump doesn't have that either electorally or, you know, who knows how else. So it's an interesting dynamic. It's a historic meeting. The question will be, is it a historic process or a historic agreement that sets in place a process? Let me stop there. We'll take questions, challenges, sort of in the threes and divide them up. So. We'll take the first three questions, curiosities, or challenges you have. Annabelle. Thank you. Second question. Okay, we'll take fourth. Go ahead. So I kind of want to go back to the human rights issue. So I know even if they're not focusing on it, like if, it, if they don't focus it on the meeting, but how do you balance like the Canadian economic strength like North Korea without like the private assistance being further? Thank you. You want to take first shot? Sure. Uh, a few points that I should have made that George made that I that also ties into the questions. Uh, again, denuclearization for North Korea means U.S. troops off the peninsula. Uh, retrenchment of assets and end to the U.S. South Korea Defense Treaty, and in some extreme cases, the end to the U.S. Japan Defense Treaty. 
then they would consider giving up their nukes. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, he spoke of denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula before North Korea had nukes. Uh, that would also mean taking South Korea out from under the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Uh, and bait and switch, I mean, the agreed framework in 1994 was all about plutonium, and we could get into a back and forth on who broke that agreement whichever way, but then it found out in 2002 that they were enriching uranium the whole time. So even if both sides had fully uh, consummated the 94 agreement on plutonium, they still had a uranium enrichment facility. Peace treaty, I really oppose that idea because the North Korean peace treaty idea says that it should be between North Korea and the United States. The only peace treaty should be between North Korea and South Korea because then you're putting North Korea on a level of representing the entire peninsula and fitting their narrative that we started the war. So you sh there should be a North-South Korea peace treaty and then if you want there could be a parallel one between the U.S. or the U.N and China, because uh, we were supporting either side. But a U.S.-North Korea <coughs> peace treaty buys into North Korean propaganda. And you're right, Kim does have more time on his hand. He doesn't have to worry about re-election. He doesn't have to worry about Twitter or anything like that. <laughs> and he's got family members, including a sister, who could take over if he dies, because the Kim name is in the Constitution, as are the nukes, which is another hint that they're not going to denuclearize, because they put nukes in their Constitution a few years ago. This is, not a, this is a state about the Kim family. This whole idea of a dynasty born from the pure bloodline of this ancient Korean king from 2333 BC. <coughs> That's why if you look when North Korean diplomats travel, the badges they wear on their lapels, it's not the North Korean flag or even the Workers' Party. It's Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un and Kim Il-sung, the two previous generations. Every house and building in North Korea has to have the portraits. And people in fires are put on the front page of the newspaper for holding the portraits out, even if they have to leave people inside. And if you ever visit Pyongyang, which I hope you don't, uh, if you get the newspaper, you're not allowed to fold any paper that has the Kim portrait on it. It has to be totally revered and kept separately. Uh, a lot of other academic, basically whether or not you think the North Korean nukes are offensive or defensive, it depends on your political line of thinking. On East Asian issues, I'm center right. So most center right academics in Korea, Japan, US or otherwise, they're gonna say this is offensive. A lot of it is based on what North Korea says themselves. You know, they have said we want our own nukes to keep our own power because we don't trust China to look out after us in, in the Soviet Union when it was around. And they say, you know, would you really risk San Francisco or Seattle for Seoul? So we're seeing them as offensive just based on what North Korea itself is saying. If you're on the other side where you think that they feel they need these because we overwhelm them so much in physical capability, then you see it as defensive. And for those who say, look at uh, Saddam or Gaddafi, they need nukes uh, to keep themselves in power. If that's the case, then why didn't we try to topple the regime before they had nukes? Their deterrent is the fact that they have 8,000 artillery guns and rockets within 31 miles of Seoul that would kill hundreds of thousands of people the minute we tried anything. So they already have a deterrent and that's the South Korean people being held hostage. Uh, I think that lower nukes would lessen conventional tension on the ground because we know that in any armed conflict, the South and the United States, depending on how much China would want to involve itself, which it did last time. Because remember, we had liberated Pyongyang in the Korean War. We had gone all the way to the Yalu River. And then the 10 divisions or so that were in Fujian province meant to take Taiwan back to the mainland they were then sent up to bail out North Korea. So depending what role China wanted to play in any future conflict, we would clearly win. And the only thing stop holding North Korea up to keep it a legitimate state versus the South is the presence of nukes that the South doesn't have that they can use as a turn against us from saving the South again. So I think that nukes, by definition, if they uh, go, then the, the overall threat goes. I think once the nukes goes, North Korea as a state ceases to exist. So I see the two working hand in hand. Uh, economic strangulation, yeah, it's a consequence. But, you know, we starved Eastern Europe during the Cold War, and a lot of East Europeans had 10 years less life expectancy than people in Western Europe. And you look at all the people who suffered in South Africa during apartheid and sanctions, but I think that was a worthy endeavor when you look at the long term. You know, that is the fault of these unelected, tyrannical governments that treat their own people like that. The number one threat to North Korean lives is the North Korean government. They kill more North Koreans and enslave more than any foreign power has. So I, I suggest you ask the North Korean mission in the United Nations 
They're on the 13th floor above a Hallmark card shop on 44th and 2nd. Ask them why they treat their people so bad. Don't ask us. Gwen, remind me of your question again. Uh, it was about like what other, if dehumanization talks or any sort of diplomacy talks happened, um, what other de escalation okay. to follow because of that? Good. Good. Um, so let me go to this backwards. I'd still say 60 40. The, the difference is um, it, it's a little bit like a thermostat in your home. Uh, it actually feels warmer as you get up to the particular spot, and then the steady temperature doesn't feel as warm as before. I think the escalation that went from 4060 to 6040 in the last three months of 17 uh, has, has leveled off, and it, it feels okay now to some people. We don't seem to have a sense of urgency, but we don't know in this high risk, high reward environment of the summit, what happens? Kim could go home and say, it is absolutely clear to us that we can never reach an agreement with the United States. I laid before a dumb US president all the alternatives and all he had was bombast and then taking in the next morning to Twitter. I don't have a serious bargaining partner for peace. The tests continue because he thinks the U.S. can be pushed that far and that there won't be a military response. Well, that puts the thing on velocity again for the tensions, and I think that's equally capable uh, of happening or e equally able to happen as it is that there might be some kind of agreement. Um, what else could happen besides or as an alternative to denuclearization? <clears throat> well, maybe the momentum to a treaty. This is where who's going to be at the table and the size of the team becomes very, very important. I worry that we're down to two or three reasonable experts about East Asian history, culture, the kinds of things that Sean has emphasized, and about the North Korean situation, that if President Trump gets in his mind that I'm going to sign a peace treaty with the North Koreans. I, I, I saw on Wikipedia that you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're still at war with them technically. Let's make a peace. I'm going to, I'm going to do something that's beyond an armistice. I'm going to sign a document without any understanding as to That nobody else has ever signed. That nobody else has ever signed or, or wouldn't for the reasons that he doesn't even understand. And there's not enough people on the side to say, Mr. President, let's talk about this for a moment before you take that action. Thank you. Um, so how that plays out, you could go from something that looks like it's a confidence building measure and a good reciprocity of a request to actually be damaging to the whole enterprise, even before you get to denuclearization. Uh, so, so, so I worry about that. I do think that there are certain kinds of dimensions of the military exercises and a continued pause and testing of both types on the North Korean side that can be seen or interpreted as a first step to denuclearization. But they actually won't be, but they serve the PR and goodwill building that gets you to the second, third, and fourth conference. Um, what else was there? Oh. Uh, the, the, the notion of sanctions. Um, as someone who stood before public audiences in the early 90s and was called the baby killer because we in, were helping to design sanctions against nuclear weapons in Iraq, I, I have some sensitivity to this question. Um, we've tried in the work at Croc with sanctions to uh, increase the humanitarian dimensions of sanctions and I think we came up with a good scheme when we came up with the notion of targeted or smart sanctions, which are focused on the leadership. It was very clear to me uh, when I worked for the panel of experts that 99% um, of the regular Korea population was unaffected by sanctions because they don't actually have an economy. And in the absence of an economy, the ability of the leadership as, you, as Milosevic was able to do, is to pass on the pain of sanctions, or as the South African government often was able to do, pass on the pain of sanctions, not only to the people, but maybe even to target it to the sectors that are most in opposition to you. That doesn't exist. The, the, the government of North Korea is what I would call a kleptocracy. It's, for all of its communist trappings, it's mastered the capitalist system of generating financial capital for its needs through, as Sean mentioned, shadow companies, interesting bank exclusion agreements, any number of different kinds of things that have been four steps ahead of the sanctions for a very, very long time. 
all of that comes back to the benefit of the regime was never meant as a capital investment to improve the quality of the people. One last point. Um, probably the most painful time I had on the panel was a meeting with UNICEF, World Food Program, and um, World Health Organization after the three units went for their annual visit to North Korea to look at the humanitarian impact of sanctions and other things. In 2011, they were given a more extensive view of the countryside and a variety of other kinds of things by the North Korean government to emphasize the impact of sanctions on agriculture and various other kinds of things. The reports that they came, we spent two days together, and the reports they debriefed me on and the kinds of things were ghastly in terms of child malnutrition and a number of other things, etc. And it was also very clear they weren't going to write up 90% of that because they wouldn't be allowed in the next time. And so when I worry about humanitarian impact of things on North Korea, I, I worry less about sanctions. I, I worry more about the inability of the international humanitarian system to be able to get access there to help people who would need help like they have in the past in other countries. Can I just add on a few points of things you said? Yeah, uh, what he said about the mm -hmm. sanctions is so true with these shadow companies and other operations. We now know a lot of the stuff is being closed down, but there are a lot of businesses around the world run by North Korea. People don't even know it's North Korea. For instance, a youth hostel in the former East Berlin, which was a, a annex to the, form, the North Korean embassy there. Backpackers playing five euros a night to stay there. They didn't realize all the money was going to the North Korean regime. North Korea runs an events hall for graduation and wedding receptions in Bulgaria. Uh, they've had slave labor go to Poland, Russia, the Middle East, Kuwait, all these countries have now shut down these businesses thanks to Trump's maximum pressure campaign, which I still think is only moderate pressure, but still more than before. And uh, countries like Kuwait, Italy, and Spain have stopped issuing visas to North Koreans and expelled the rest of them and kicked out their diplomats. So that's, and they run restaurants in Thailand, tour groups in Malaysia. So they're, they're involved in all these shadowy businesses around the world. The peace treaty gambit or lark on which Trump might embark, that's why a lot of East Asian conservatives in Korea and Japan were very quietly hoping for a Hillary Clinton victory because they were afraid that Trump might trade them away if it meant something good for him in terms of his legacy or better trade. So uh, that is a real threat that he doesn't have somebody next to him. I think Bolton might play that role, saying, you know, this actually a peace treaty, that's not what it means. That's a capitulation, that's a selling out of the South. I actually, I've always thought the chance of actual conflict is very low. I would have to put it at 10 to 15%. The regime's chief goal is survival, which is why they need to get rid of South Korea in the long run, if they want to exist. So they want us to think they might attack or might use the nukes, which would make us hesitate coming to South Korea's defense, but they're not actually going to do anything because they know that would mean their own demise. So regime preservation is the number one goal. I know people talk about miscalculation, but we've come much closer, whether it's the seizure of the Pueblo, in the late 60s, the axe chopping incident in 76, other things that have happened in the region, we've come much closer to almost having a war again, and we did it. So in this hyper-connected world, I'm pretty sure we would know with the other side, the red line. And I do think that they think Trump might be crazy enough to do something, because there were two major threats that North Korea made that, on which they did not follow through. And that said that they would shoot a missile toward Guam. And what they did was they instead shot it the length that it would travel to Guam, but intentionally over Japan in another direction to say, we didn't, but we could have if we wanted to. So that was a face-saving way out, because that's when Trump had his famous fire and fury comment, if they tried the thing with Guam. So they did it. And then he made the threat, the foreign minister did at the UN General Assembly, that they would do an atmospheric bomb test of a hydrogen bomb over the Pacific. Uh, and they haven't done that yet. So in the two biggest threats that they made last year, they didn't actually follow through. So they may think Trump's just crazy enough to, to hit them. So I'm, I actually think that the chance of conflict is pretty low. Next round of questions. Just on uh, sanctions and security sector, sanctions, I know a lot of, there's been a lot of issues with China. So, you know, let's see if you like the, you know, um, you know whole North Korean aspects in this road council in China. How do you Good question. Others? Yeah. Um, in a denuclearization treaty or like any other sort of agreement with North Korea, is there anything that the United States is willing to give up? Um, and like, what would that be? Good 
good question. Uh, speaking of other denuclearization agreements, uh, if the U.S. were to pull out of the agreements with Iran right now, how would you think that affect uh, the North Korean negotiations, if at all? Okay. <clears throat> Do you mind if I go first? No. Let, let me start with the last one first. <coughs> 99% of the discussion and reaction to that concern, which became apparent as soon as Trump was elected and became fodder for the pundits, uh, was that how can you convince Kim to do a deal with the Americans if Trump goes back on a deal that was negotiated where the Iranians really did march away from the verge of being able to build a weapon? Now we can talk about whether they were, but, but all right, so that was, that was the parlance. Then about three or four months in, really interesting set of uh, alternative views came into punditry, which was A, Kim doesn't care about any other agreements under any other conditions. He cares only about the agreement with the United States. And B, the great ace in the hole that Trump has to play is, of course I did away with the Iran agreement. I didn't negotiate it. You want an agreement that lasts? Negotiate it with me. I'm the order of the deal. See, I'm from New York, so I can get a little Trump kind of thing here. <laughs> so, uh, what do the North Koreans see in that? Does the administration embrace the kind of alternative view about the Iranian agreement? I don't know. What is most clear about what happened with the Iranian agreement is, A, the United States doesn't seem to want to do denuclearization or nuclear monitoring from afar. It wants penetration in the sovereign state of IAEA inspectors to go along with satellite photography, to go along with seismic testing, and any number of other kinds of things. Will the North Korean regime, as I understand it, ever permit that? No. So the dilemma of doing away or not doing away with the Iranian deal is less important than the only available political and technological way to actually verify denuclearization is something like we had in the 94 agreement where uh, international folks and US folks go and actually watch a plutonium factory be And that's not gonna happen this time, I think. Uh, sanctions. Consistent with what each of us have said sort of more indirectly, I'm much more concerned about Malaysian non-compliance in shutting down the financial agencies that operate as a huge base of currency for North Korea out of Malaysia, uninhibited, than I am about whether or not China's smuggling 10% of the 90% of coal that they used to get. Um, we, need, we need Chinese political clout in a way in which I think we can accept, and I'm a minority on this, we can accept a certain amount of sanctions leakage economically to retain the political clout. But people of goodwill and expertise disagree on that a great deal. Your turn. Uh, on sanctions, we've passed the legislation for the secondary sanctions, and Treasury's authorized it. George is right, it's not just China. Malaysia in particular, you would have thought after Kim Jong-nam was poisoned <coughs> at KLI Airport that they would be more up in arms over this. And then uh, North Korea actually took hostage Malaysians living in North Korea until they freed the North Korean diplomats accused of carrying out the hit. But apparently not. But, and also, North Korea, China trade statistics are misleading. You'll see, they'll say, uh, you know, Bloomberg's obviously a great network because they have both of us on regularly, so they agree. <laughs> but one stat that drives me nuts is they'll say, oh, 85% of North Korea's trade is with China. That's like saying that, you know, that's when an iPhone comes from China, 100% of the value gets added to the US China trade deficit, even if only 5% of the material is actually from China. China's just a conduit to other countries because it's North Korea's connection to the Asian continent. Everything goes through China, but it's actually destined for all these other places where they do business. 
but Chinese banks handle a lot of North Korean payments because a lot of despots want to be paid in dollars. So we so far have only sanctioned one Chinese bank, the Bank of Dengdong. We haven't gotten serious. I don't know what Trump's waiting for. Maybe as part of this China trade war, he'll stop playing nice with Xi Jinping and hopefully his teasing joining TPP again uh, suggests he might follow through. But in practical terms, what you would do is to trade in U.S. dollars, you need to have a correspondent bank on U.S. soil. So that even if a Dutch and Swedish company sell a trade in dollars, the payment has to pa pass through a U.S. bank on U.S. soil. So any Chinese bank found to be in violation, and we know who they are, we would just suspend their U.S. bank account. So if they have a correspondent banking account with Bank of America in Seattle, we would cut that as part of uh, financing. So we could do it very easily. I don't know why we haven't. Uh, that's something for the administration. Russia is also big on oil and other kind of uh, sanctions violations. What would we give up? Hopefully nothing. Uh, what we did sadly give up in 2005 as part of the six party talks was we found out one of these banks in Macau was operating called Bank Delta Asia and they were financing a lot of North Korea. Remember, North Korea is a complete international gangster criminal enterprise. They run drugs in Japan, stolen cars in Eastern Europe, uh, stolen cell phones in Bangladesh, and they use diplomatic pouches to cover the goods. A lot of drug business. In 1976, all their diplomats were kicked out of Norway because they were using diplomatic pouches from their embassy in Poland to sell Polish vodka illegally for hard currency on the streets of Oslo. And all the local liquor stores were complaining because they were losing their business. Uh, so they're complete gangsters. And we had targeted this one bank, Bank BDA, Bank Delta Asia, and seized $25 million. They went bananas. This became the big thing. So Bush released it as a sign of goodwill in the six party talks, and then also took them off the state sponsor of terrorism list in 2008. Because in 1987, one year ahead of the 1988 Seoul Olympics, North Korean agents posing as Japanese, where they had learned how to be Japanese from these 13 abductees that Shinzo Abe cares so much about, uh, using a fake Japanese passport, they got off in Baghdad and Abu Dhabi and left a bomb and a Panasonic cassette player in the overhead deck and blew up a Korean airliner, killing over 500 civilians and construction workers coming home from the Middle East. This was to scare people from going to South Korea for the Olympics because South Korea didn't want to share the Olympics with the North. So it's a complete terrorist, narco, gangster state. And then Trump, thankfully, put them back on the state sponsor of terrorism this year because of the abductions, but also because of the killing of Kim Jong-nam in the Malaysian airport. Uh, so I think sanctions relief, uh, you know, letting go of some of these banking restrictions, that would probably be something that North Korea would like. But again, I would hope we didn't do it. And then Iran and North Korea are totally different situations because there's not a South Iran. And Iran doesn't need nukes to exist. You know, it's going to carry out some mission against Israel. North Korea needs the nukes to exist. Also, North Korea, Iran never broke out with the nuke. So, you know, we were able to get in there, and I think the deal as it is basically guarantees Iran and a nuke if in 10 years if they're just patient and wait, but that's another issue for another class. But the difference is that they didn't have the nuke already. They were also much more integrated in the world economy than North Korea is above the board. North Korea already has the nukes. They're in a fight for their survival, and they're, they're under the table uh, sanctions-wise. North Korea and Iran are actually great allies. For the first North Korean nuclear test in 2016, there were four Iranian generals on the launch pad. And were they to get the nukes, I'm sure that they're going to be, North Korea is going to be selling the scuds on which to launch them. And when Israel bombed the Syrian reactor in 2005 and they picked it apart, a lot of the mechanics and parts inside were North Korean. And of course, that would have come through Iran. So uh, I consider the Iran and North Korea kind of like apples and oranges. I, I don't even bring it up. And even if we follow through and study in Iran, North Korea has a long list of things that we have apparently done to betray them and gone back into work. So they don't even need the Iran deal. Most North Koreans don't even, inside North Korea, wouldn't even know about the Iran deal. They don't follow, and they're not giving the news about the outside world. That, that's a thing that Europeans care about. Let me take one other crack at that, Elsa, about your, your good question. Um, I think that the issue would be real, full, inspected denuclearization, which is probably unrealistic, but, but that's one level of denuclearization. And the other is 
promises, end of testing, what really is called denuclearization, which is falling back on deterrence as a strategy that will accept, and I think this is very acceptable to the North Koreans, uh, they might give up one facility, they might pledge to do this, they might pledge to do that in exchange for a recognition that they're frozen without any ability to monitor. Now, I can't see any American president, including Trump, in his wildest days accepting that, but it's possible. I don't know under these American political conditions what happens given the sense that historically there's been no president who submitted an arms control agreement really to the Senate for confirmation in decades. Trump and his people probably think whatever they work out, they work out. They don't need Senate confirmation. What happens if Mr. Trump comes back and says, by gosh, know what I got in my back pocket? I have a deal. And here's, here's, here's the deal. I trust this guy. He pledged to denuclearize. We're not going to see any more tests, no more threats, airline and satellite surveillance. Bet you're going to be no more big booms, nothing like that at all. We're good. But what does the American Congress do? I mean, we know it's going to be 24 hours a day on CNN. We got a crazy man, whatever, and, and Fox declaring him a hero because there are poised certain kinds of polarization here now that will accept a deal when a deal is done, regardless of what the details may be. So that's what makes it a curious time. Maybe to sum up, I'm going to give Sean five minutes and me five minutes about where we see this going, where, what final words you might have. It's funny, Fox, because uh, I saw Laura Ingram and a few other people totally rip Trump on the Syrian airstrikes. Yeah. Uh, and then you have Anderson Cooper and other people praising him for the humanitarian gesture. So, it's, you know, every once in a while, mm -hmm. the exceptions prove the rule. Of course, I wouldn't watch fake news CNN, but somebody told me. <laughs> uh, I can't, I can't stand any of the networks, actually. Because if so, I really, for any real news, you got to watch Bloomberg or BBC, because, you know, everyone else, their agenda. I think I've said everything I pretty much need to say. You know, I, I think I'll be sleeping with one eye open throughout this process. Very interesting to see what happens today in Mar-a-Lago uh, with the Japanese Prime Minister pleading Trump not to sacrifice Japan in the name of reducing the North Korean threat. Then next Friday, we have the North-South Korean leaders meeting at the DMZ. That really, you know, could set the stage uh, for Trump Kim. And then we'll see what else happens. You know, Pompeo will likely be confirmed by then. Uh, we'll see what other distractions happen in Syria on the domestic political front in the U.S. Again, the more harried or put out Trump feels on domestically on politics from Mueller's investigation or whatever, it could cause him more to grab for something dramatic on North Korea for a legacy. Again, I think Bush went too far too soon on North Korea with the six-party talks almost to sort of pull himself out of Iraq uh, at his Nixon moment. And I, I think definitely taking him off the state sponsor of terrorism list was a step too far too soon. Otherwise, I'm just cautiously pessimistic about the whole thing. So uh, I'm, if nothing happens, I'm perfectly fine with that. Hopefully we don't give up too much. Because North Korea's end goal is the removal of US troops and the unification of the peninsula in their terms. That, they are very consistent on that. And any step toward that, I feel, is a step backwards. And I'm cautiously cautious. I believe that there may be an interesting historical path unfolding in the dialogue between North and South. And it would be interesting in a different administrative climate in the US to have someone who would be willing to let that move forward as far as it might and see what that then opens up for the prospects of some other confidence building measures with the West or with the US. Uh, I, I'm befuddled by the con, let's say the convoluting of politics and economics in this administration that the notion of trade difficulties, trade wars, accenting the smallest difficulty of a trade balance to blow up other things and then jeopardize the political agreement you want to build with 
actually allies like Japan or the South or with reasonable foes like China that you need, that, that we're, we're, we're on the one hand extending an olive branch uh, with one hand and shooting with the other, essentially, in the political versus economic. We want cooperation, we want a further interest maybe of allies, uh, and at the same time we want, we want the best available economic squeeze we can put on everybody to have it reverberate well. So, so, so I feel like there's not a political economy of defense strategy operating here. There's a certain politics which is more whimsical than I want. There's an economics which is incredibly nationalistic and pre-Kinsian. And I, I, I don't know what to do with that other than to say we live in interesting times. But I'm, I'm cautious about the caution in that I think even with my 60-40 ratio, the escalations haven't increased. One of the first questions came about intent. I think the intentions of both sides have calmed down a little bit, partly because they've each derived political and military benefit from the muscle flexing and the escalatory cycle they had earlier. And right now, there are more benefits to the politics of a summit than there are to the politics of increased crisis. And then we'll see what happens. As Trump always says. We'll see what we'll happens. Us we'll we'll New York guys talking yeah. about that. Well, you're from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, I'm no. just from Long Island. I'm a suburb. <laughs> I didn't know that. That yeah. changes everything. Folks. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Show them hang around a little bit if you got things to say to him or questions.